Hi everyone, um, welcome to the June edition of the EGRI Research Seminars. It's really great to see everybody, even though it's virtually. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Uta Brady. I'm a postdoc at Syracuse University and I'm also the EGRI Lab Manager. So please feel free to contact me if you have any questions related to the EGRI, we're always happy to help. Um, before we get started, I just have one quick housekeeping item. Um, this is the last uh, research seminar that's going to take place on a Friday. So as of next month in July, we'll be moving the research seminars to the first Tuesday of the month. And it'll be from noon to one Eastern time. So just uh, make sure that you note that. So it's going to be July 6th is our next uh, research seminar. And that'll be on a Tuesday, noon to one. Um, that's all I have for housekeeping, Saba. Is there anything else that you wanted to do? discuss and I'm putting you on the spot. Nope. nope, nothing from my side. Thank you. Okay. All right. So enough talking about next month's seminar. Um, we're very uh, fortunate to have professors Tanya Heikela and Chris Weibel from the University of Colorado Denver uh, presenting here today. And they're going to be talking about their, uh, using the institutional grammar to analyze public policy in the context of oil and gas development in the United States. And just to give you a, a quick background, um, so Tanya is focused, research is focused on policy processes and environmental governance. She's particularly interested in how conflict and collaboration arise in policy processes and uh, what types of institutions support collaboration, learning and conflict resolution. And some of her recent research has looked at interstate watersheds, large scale ecosystem restoration programs and unconventional oil and gas development. Is that about correct? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and then uh, Chris's uh, uh, focuses on political conflict um, in relation to public policy issues as well. And his projects include studying multi stakeholder collaboration processes and aquaculture partnerships, assessing policy design and improving outcomes in organic farming. And again, looking at oil and gas development, in particular fracking. Is that fair? <laughs> Yeah, Tony and I kind of do the same thing. So yeah. <laughs> we, we, try, we try to we try to like describe ourselves differently sometimes, but it doesn't quite work all the time. All right. Well, without any further ado, I'm going to give the floor to our speakers. All right. Can everybody see the screen now? That look good. Okay. Perfect. Um, so thank you everybody for um, showing up today for this. Uh, webinar and it, you know Chris and I were just talking about how nice it is to have have these webinar opportunities over zoom because we can get such a, a broad audience and um, it really is uh, wonderful to see so many faces that we don't normally get to see and I guess this is one of the, the benefits of of this COVID year so um, nice to see everybody so we're going to share some research today um, that we've been working on for the past few years together that uses the inst institutional grammar to help us analyze public policies. And as Uta said, uh, we've done this largely in the context of studying oil and gas um, governance policies in the United States. And so we'll give you a couple uh, empirical examples of that. Uh, but before we jump into the, the public policies, we wanna kind of give you some background, uh, especially since this is the, the IGRI seminar, give you some background on you know, what we've, why, why we are kind of adapting some of the um, approaches of using the institutional grammar uh, for studying it in, in the context that we're, we're doing. So for those of you not familiar with the institutional grammar, which I, I assume most of you are, but if, if you're not, uh, the institutional grammar was originally devised by uh, Crawford and Ostrom in 1995 to analyze the content of public policy or institutional statements, uh, which can include uh, public policy statements um, along certain generalizable features, um, such as what actions are required or permitted or forbidden by which actors and under which contexts, and what are the rewards or sanctions for those actions. So the IG or the institutional grammar uh, helps us then measure theoretical concepts of interest to policy and institutional scholars um, through this approach. So we can look at things like institutional diversity or, or 
uh, policy change or polycentricity. Uh, and that's one of the, the benefits of having this kind of systematic approach of diagnosing um, the structure of institutional statements. Of course, the institutional grammar has evolved over the years. Um, if you look at the Siddiqui et al. paper in 2019, you can kind of see an overview of some of those evolution, evolutionary um, approaches to the IG. And that's helped increase the reliability and precision of institutional grammar, but some questions remain about its theoretical and practical usefulness, especially in large samples of public policy, um, even when we're trying to use automated or semi-automated coding approaches. And some of these overarching challenges uh, in using the institutional grammar to study public policy or, or um, you know, large numbers of public policy in particular include whether the assumptions underlying the grammar are appropriate for uh, large samples of institutional statements once we start to take the individual statements that are included in a policy and, and put them together. Uh, they may function in, in, in concert in ways that um, may not be picked up by the in institutional grammar approach of focusing on institutional statements specifically. So if you're looking for the meaning of institutions as a whole, uh, that can be a challenge when using the institutional grammar at the statement level. So that raises questions about how to upscale the, the research effort to study theoretically meaningful features of the designs of public policies. Um, and in particular, each of the individual syntactic components has certain advantages and disadvantages that need to be considered when applying institutional grammar. So I'm gonna turn this over to Chris and he's gonna jump in and explain some of these things and I'll just try to make sure I, I click the enter arrow at the right time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks Tanya and hi everybody. Uh, thanks for showing up, good to see your faces. Um, yeah, so we're gonna start off just by going through some of the kind of the grammatical components um, and talk about the advantages and disadvantages and, um, and also how we kind of deal with that actually. What is the attribute? Um, it was originally defined as to whom the institutional statement applies. Very generic statement, um, a description. Uh, we've changed that actually, I think back in 2011, basically, to whom that carries out the aim, essentially puts it into the subject of the sentence, let's say, more or less. And then we did this for a lot of reasons. One was it just led to good, reliable coding, um, which is valuable in itself. Um, and, you know, and uh, it also provides uh, insights into the agency if you want to know who's doing the action. Um, this can be really helpful, especially in so small samples, and we can understand that. Of course, the disadvantages are perhaps lacks validity. We pushed the reliability um, uh, 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 kind of criteria hard at the beginning. Um, and well, perhaps we need to go back and look at the validity of what we're doing, especially in large samples. And you know, we have the example here, you know, the student must send the exam to the professor. The professor must receive the exam from the student. Um, and maybe in a small sample, that relationship, who's in the subject and who's in the object, let's say, or wherever it is in the sentence, um, maybe that matters if we can really look at it. Um, but sometimes these, you know, in other times, these two sentences might have exactly the same meaning, um, yet to be coded differently in the grammar. And this kind of raises questions about, okay, so what are we really trying to tackle here? But also let's say we even tackle this, let's say we can categorize our verbs and, and get this into, underway. At least when I started looking at, at these relationships between let's say actors, students, professors, it's often conditioned not just on the, the verb, the aim, often it's on the condition. And sometimes you need to understand the overall context and who these actors, these attributes are, where these agents are. And, and, and so it, it does matter for perhaps we can make sense of this at small samples, but when you're looking at 10,000 statements, sometimes like this, may, maybe we need to kind of rethink about what we're doing here with the actors in these, um, uh, in the attributes in these statements. So what's our time? Let's go to the next slide here. Um, uh, the solution, hey, let's just go back to the original definition. It's changed over time. And Crawford notion defined as to whom the institutional statement applies. And so let's treat all actors in the institutional statement as potentially important agents. It doesn't matter if they show up in the condition, the object, the attribute. And you know what, this is easy. We have a lot of automated approaches to just extract actors. It makes it quite simple um, in that regard. Well, not quite simple. It makes it easier than before. Uh, and yeah, um, avoids assuming, um, you know, kind of perhaps falsely uh, placing the actor in, in the, you know, in a, a statement and perhaps interpreting it wrong. And um, 
So there's some advantages. The disadvantages might be just the loss of categorization. I would also like to add here too, is like, you know, I, when I show up these EGRI um, presentations, it amazes me when I see other people present their work and they emphasize the actors in the attribute category and the object category. And I remember seeing one and these actors were listed in the conditions, right? And they didn't even mention those actors as if they weren't important. And, and maybe they're not, but maybe they are, but, but the way it's currently done, we often ignore actors in other categories. And that's, and that's just by the lens of the grammar. The second is the aim. The aim originally was included all actions and quote how those actions are conducted. That's the way uh, off, uh, Crawford and Ostrom actually defined it. We later placed the how into the conditions. Great for liable coding. Again, this gets into issues related to uh, how we think about action in our kind of our statements. The example here, um, you know, here there's, you know, the first one is basically two statements. I think we'd probably separate that. Uh, the second one is one statement, but the email is now in the condition by emailing. It's still an action, but it's in the condition. Um, and perhaps we can pull that out, but maybe we should really think about, okay, do we really care about action only in the aim? If not, um, maybe we should just look for action anywhere in these statements and, and, and think about what the aim really means. So Tanya, can you go forward? Yeah. So again, the def that's our solution is to go back to the original definition and define aim as it kept seeing all descriptions of action. It's easy to communicate, avoids losing action in the conditions and possibly elsewhere. Um, of course, that's the disadvantage too. We lose that categorization, but it's easy to do. The object, of course, this, was, this wasn't this was even part of the original grammar. It was added for liability reasons and for good, good, good reasons. It added a hell of a lot for reliability. Uh, it kind of solidified the attribute as carrying out the aim and the receiver of, of the aim. A lot of good stuff here, aligned with the direct indirect objects of sentences. Um, but still also gets into like, it emphasized certain objects or things in the grammar or in the policies that we're analyzing, but perhaps de-emphasize other things, kind of like the actors. We might find actors elsewhere in a sentence in the institutional statements, but we may ignore those if they're not in the attribute of the object. Same thing with objects, actually. There's important objects that could appear even in the attribute category that we could ignore if we only pay attention to what the object is. And so the solution, Tanya, going forward is to go uh, is to mirror the uh, definition of attributes and say objects are the things that the institutional statement applies to basically. And so we basically identify all things. What's a thing is actually a good question, but it's also just as important as we'll realize even with institutional grammar of theoretical interest in a public policy. Uh, it, it kind of builds from um, the original institutional grammar, meaning the attributes. But again, we lose some of the categorization in the institutional grammar if you want that, that, that syntactic kind of grammatical categorization. Time, let's go forward one more. Oh, well then here we go, this nice summary slide. Um, these are our, our categories. We're still doing conditions and or else's. Um, but basically what we've done, we take the definitions, we've gone back to Ostrom and Crawford and say, hey, let's just go back to the very basics and note that we're not just looking at institutional statements, but now we're just analyzing public policy as a unit of analysis. So to whom does the public policy apply? And I'll show you why that's, we just, we're doing that now, because sometimes it doesn't matter, just, just as it does, um, you know, maybe it doesn't matter where in the, the, the sentence it applies, perhaps it doesn't matter where an actor uh, uh, situates himself in a public policy either. And the, what's good about this approach is that the, the extraction approach is easy. You can extract actors from public policies, we can extract inanimate things, we can extract verbs, actions, and of course, we can do the deontics. The deontics is, I think, the only thing from the institutional grammar originally designed by Croft and Rostrum that's the same, it hasn't changed. And we keep it that way. Okay, so I'm gonna now jump into uh, a more specific example. So Chris did a nice job of teeing this up for me and, and kind of getting the, the methods primed for you, but we're going to illustrate here um, the approach that we've taken for a couple different uh, papers uh, that are now published, and, and we have some references for those, and, and a couple more that are in the works. And as I mentioned before, we have largely applied this to the study of public policies related to oil and gas development in the United States. And so by, by public policies, um, we're talking about legislation, uh, regulations, executive orders, um, those types of, of formal policies that are, are written. Um, in, in our case, we're looking at uh, state level policies in the US. Um, so 
we've used this semi-automated approach for applying these uh, insights from the grammar to unpack the design of these public policies. And the first thing you have to do when you use a semi-automated method is to create what's called a dictionary, uh, sometimes called a thesaurus, depending on what program you're using or, or what kind of standards you're using in, in the literature. Um, and in our case, we start with the original definitions that uh, Chris just went over of the attributes, objects, aims, and deontics. And we take those definitions and apply them to public policies as our unit of analysis. So rather than the institutional statement, we are looking at the, the policy as a whole. And so we're looking for indicators of these attributes, objects, aims, and deontics. And then we categorize their types um, based on an inductive review that we do initially. Um, so we review the policies manually uh, for keywords by category. And so the attributes, uh, we look for different types of actors and we might find um, you know, all these named actors and find that they cluster in, into particular categories like local governments or state governments or federal governments. And uh, similarly, we look for objects and we might cluster them or categorize them by kind of themes, um, which we've called issues. Um, Aims, we've kind of categorized according to rule types um, and deontics, we stick with deontics. <laughs> and then we conduct some intercoder agreement checks on our dictionary of all of these words that might be indicative of those categories of the, the grammar. And we, you could supplement this with other inductive types of methods as well, like LDA um, approaches, which um, are more automated, but uh, still inductive in, in developing kind of patterns of, of words from the text. Of course, before we run any analysis, we also have to clean our text using um, policy or the sections of the policy as units of analysis. We take out punctuation and things like that. Uh, we identify then the frequency of different dictionary categories for each policy. And then we analyze those policies using different methods, could be network, approaches, uh, descriptive analyses, cluster analyses, et cetera. So here's just a, a visualization of one of our, um, just a snapshot of a piece of our, our dictionary for um, one of our states. I think this was from Colorado. And you'll see in here that the attributes, we, we categorize them into different actor types. So the, in the far, my far left-hand column here, you'll see the more specific names of actors that were found in uh, all of the policies that we identified. And then we categorize them in this thesaurus or dictionary according to particular types of, of actors. Um, same with the objects and uh, aims, we categorize those into to different types as well. And then, as I mentioned, you have to clean and run the auto map, which we've used. You can use R, you could use Python, you could use other um, software to, to run the semi-automated analysis once you have the dictionary. Um, but before you run that analysis, again, you have to remove things like punctuation and, and symbols uh, and decide what your unit of observation is. And as I mentioned before, our unit of observation is a public policy, so a particular bill or a particular piece of regulation rather than a, a sections of those policies. And then we run um, AutoMap to pick up uh, the, the frequency of those categories of words that we put into our dictionary, and it spits out um, you know, some, some basic frequencies, frequency um, statistics, basically you know, a spreadsheet that shows, oh, in this row here at the top, this was one bill, a policy that we were analyzing, and it had, you know, a certain number of federal actors identified, a certain number of state actors identified, et cetera. So each of these uh, columns in the spreadsheet would be the uh, categories or the types of um, categories of the institutional grammar attributes that we, or syntactic components that we're measuring. So Chris is going to go through then some actual kind of 
data, um, a couple illustrative examples for us so you can see how this plays out. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. And um, we have two examples. The first one has been published and some of you may have seen and the second one hasn't yet. Um, and the first one, we basically look at the kind of the theory, the, the concept of polycentricity, the idea of multiple centers of power uh, or authority that overlap um, and, uh, to some extent. And we portray it through public policies. And um, so we're gonna do this for Colorado. We're looking at 55 oil and gas policies in this state. And um, so this is an important slide to look at because we have on the left column, we have our basically institutional grammar kind of definitions. We have the attribute, the object, aim, deontics. And this is where the, and this, the, the dictionary, the thesaurus that Tanya showed, it really comes into play here, where you see the, the number of text level concepts in the, the thesaurus. That's kind of like our dictionary kind of um, categorization. For example, in our dictionary, we had 289 potential, or well, we maybe have more than that, but objects. And, and, um, and that's kind of the, the, these are kind of like the, the things that kind of, the, that appeared in, in the, the different objects that appeared in, the, in the, let's say the, the 55 policies. But then you have to kind of go through it again and figure, okay, because some of these are, they're not synonymous, but sometimes they kind of fall in the same kind of functional category that we care about. And, and, uh, and so for various theoretical reasons, you might want to like, let's say with the 248 aims that we've appeared, at least like since they verb type words, how can we kind of think about that from a theoretical point of view or, or somehow simplify it? And so that's like this middle column of high level concepts in the, in the SARS. So for example, we have 54 actors that we kind of, actor categories that we care about out of those 233. In fact, we even simplify that further down to 11 that I'll show you. Um, and we also kind of cluster these 289 objects into eight different issue categories. We did this inductively actually, but even if you did the institutional grammar, let's say regardless, you might get 233 attributes. You still have to do this step, right? You still have to somehow apply some sort of categorization that has theoretical relevance for what you're doing. And there's a lot of assumptions embedded in this, both of these steps actually, that we don't talk enough about. And I think Tanya and I could both talk about this at another time. But on the for frequency in the word count on the far right is what you see in Colorado out of these 55 policies. So for example, within these 54 actor categories or even these 233 attribute categories, you have 8,843 actors that have kind of popped up. Some of, the, of course, some of these are the same actors. Overall, we, we extracted about 73,000 words or 72,000 words. Tony, I think we can um, move on from here to the next one. And you know, again, here we're looking at polycentricity. These policies, these 55 public policies emerge from four venues in Colorado. These are the four major kind of state level venues. We're not looking at cities or courts. Um, and so we have the General Assembly, Assembly, COGCC, which is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, CDPHE is another regulatory agency, the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment, and the governor. These are our four major venues. So you have the Assembly, the governor, and two regulatory agencies. And, and basically what these little um, heat plots show is the darker the color, the more likely the frequency of the different, say, parts of the grammar that appear or use in that, in that venue. What's most important here is the idea of polycentricity. So for example, if you look at down in issues, for example, you'll see that the COGCC, it's black and it highly emphasizes, let's say oil and gas development. Uh, and it does so significantly differently than the other venues. But it's not like the other venues don't deal with this issue. It's just that COGCC deals with it a lot. Whereas, for example, the General Assembly, the legislature deals mostly with tax and finance. I guess not like other uh, venues don't deal with it, but the General Assembly deals with it a lot. Uh, you have similar layouts with the actors. Of course, every venue deals with, let's say, oil and gas industry. Some target, let's say, other state agencies more than others. Um, but this is to us like a, a pretty interesting portrayal of polycentricity. We also did, you know, um, rules and deontics even on this, which is also kind of interesting. It suggests that like almost like a functional role in the system. So, for example, COGCC deals most it deals more with information rules and like say the whatever monitoring and enforcement and monitoring might be part of that um, in this function. Whereas the General Assembly might deal more with, let's say, more with authority rules, which also makes sense. It's allocating authority in the system, uh, but not significantly different though. But this is, uh, again, just one of our papers. It's in uh, International Journal of Commons about how to portray polycentricity. Um, Tanya, you want to move forward to the next one? The next one, okay. So the first one is just descriptive, basically. Like how you describe the system in one state. But now, okay, let's, let's think about how we can think about this from a, you know, why does it might matter? So, okay, now we're looking at only one venue, legislatures, but we're looking at 15 states. We're looking at all 160 oil and gas policies adopted, legislatures, legislation adopted in those states. 
And we're gonna look at basically the relationship between let's say rules, actors, rules, objects, and deontics. We're not doing actors here. And uh, I'll talk about that in a sec. Our dependent variables duration actually. So, so we're only looking at policies that, that have been adopted. We're not looking at, at least in this paper of policies that were not adopted, that were proposed, let's say. So only policies that were adopted. And our question is, does the institutional design somehow affect the duration? Meaning, is there something about the institutional rules that make some policies take longer to adopt than others, controlling for everything we can imagine we could control for? Yeah, so let, oh, someone's mute. let's go down to the next one, Tanya. And this is this is the hazards model. Again, the dependent variable is the duration. This is actually, it's probably poorly labeled. We're only looking at policies that have been adopted. And we're not looking at actors in this situation. And this is, by the way, one of our models we did actually last year. We've actually updated this. Um, but it's not quite in um, presentation form yet. And here you'll see, for example, and this, these are odd ratios, but um, um, but actually anything below above zero is actually uh, takes longer. So for example, constitutive rules take longer to adopt um, than not, if they're not there. The more done constitutional rules, the more must take longer to adopt. Uh, policies with more must take longer to adopt than policies without, with less must. Uh, similar with indicators related to oil and gas um, operations. Um, those also take longer to adopt, and also the same with tax and finance, take longer to adopt. Um, you should note that we have added more and more controls to this. We've also added actors, although we only have 168 observations, so we're kind of dealing with a whatever, a degrees of freedom Thank issue. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're kind of we're still kind of playing with this, but the results are pretty robust. But you know, it's also what's interesting here is that you know theoretically we don't really have a good theory of why some of these things pop up than others. Really, this is one of those great examples where we're just kind of doing this and you know quantitatively via like almost in, induction basically. Say, so what what pops up significant? We really don't quite know, and we also don't even know how generalizable these results are actually. But it is one way that we're starting to look at. Um, uh, the, the components of public policies and how they relate to perhaps a dependent variable of interest. Here, just the, how long it takes to, to, to pass um, in the state legislature. Um, I think, Tanya, I think the floor is yours now. Yeah, so we just want to kind of wrap up here for, for you all so we can open it up to a conversation. And uh, before I, we do that, though, I just want to hit a couple of the kind of main points that we're trying to make here and what some of the contributions we see of this, this type of approach of using the institutional grammar for uh, public policy research. And so first we, we think that it you know, provides a, a kind of new spin on the institutional grammar, um, building of course from the original definitions in Crawford and Ostrom um, that can be suitable for a large in analysis of, of public policies. Um, and in doing so, it reminds us that there are many ways to conduct research based on the institutional grammar, um, each, of course, with its trade-offs. So the approach we're taking has limitations, uh, but there, it also has advantages that try to address some of the limitations uh, that come up with other forms of applications of, of the institutional grammar. Uh, we think it offers a technique that's relatively easy to apply and, and communicate. Um, it does have the advantage of also avoiding potentially misleading uh, syntactic categories when interpreting the large samples of institutions um, and focuses on potentially theoretically meaningful uh, word categories in, in public policies. And in doing so, it offers some potential new theoretical opportunities as we look more inductively at, at the kind of meaning of some of these word categories. Um, it helps us identify patterns in the data that um, raise new questions. Um, Chris's example that he just uh, talked about around you know, studying how the design of policies might relate to the duration of public policy can um, inform you know, questions about policy conflicts and policy debates, for example. And then finally, it builds some original insights uh, from the inductive development of these categories. Uh, for instance, by, category, by categorizing uh, the aims through kind of our inductive look at the, the words that are in these public policies, uh, we've identified um, different types of rules than uh, we typically see in the IAD's rules type, rule typology. 
And so some next steps for advancing the institutional grammar uh, for the purposes of analyzing public policies um, are first to improve our text extraction and analysis techniques. Um, some of this is a little clunky and um, time consuming and we could streamline, streamline it better. Um, you also probably notice we haven't talked much about the conditions and so we're, we need to develop better approaches for analyzing those through, through these techniques and um, working on their interpretation. And then we also need to, to develop both inductive and deductive approaches for classifying the words uh, per category. So classifying aims into rules, objects into issues, attributes into actors, et cetera. Um, we've done this largely inductively, but uh, with partly with the exception of aims into rules, we've used deductive approaches there, but um, it, it requires a lot of um, massaging and, and um, creativity in that process. And so we need to continue to, to refine that. And then we also need to continue to work on intercoder reliability. We've gotten pretty good reliability uh, when we've done um, manual intercoder reliability checks, but uh, we could do that uh, more efficiently as well. And then finally, you know, we have to continue to work on the, the theory and applications and answering the so what question. That is, you know, once we unpack these, these policies and look at how they're, they're designed using this approach, um, what does that help us understand? So far, we've helped, we've helped inform the literature on polycentricity and we're, we're working on understanding some issues related to the duration of public policies and what that might say about conflicts, uh, but there's a lot more to do in that regard. So we look forward to your questions and just wanna say thanks for your time and the opportunity to share our research with you. Should I stop the share? Look at that. You can see people. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for that presentation. Yep, the floor is open for questions. Ah, as Azulada? Uh, hello, excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. I just have a request and a question. The request is, uh, do you have any replication materials that you could share um, for us to understand your uh, research uh, a little at length? And my question is, uh, could you give us some preliminary answers to the so what question that you raised at the end, that the part that you're still working on? Sure. Yeah. Um, Tony, do you want to handle that or want you to take a stab at this? How do you want to? Uh, well, the, so the replication materials, um, you can email us and we have shared our, our dictionary with, uh, with others and, and all of our kind of methodological steps have been outlined in the, the publications that we have. And um, there was another publication that we were thinking about including in our presentation today as well, but we I think presented an early version of that last year, so we didn't want to overlap too much. But um, yeah, you can email either Chris or I for um, those materials, and we'll be, we'd be happy to send them to you. Uh, and then your other question was about the, the so what, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, Chris, do you want to start <laughs> with the so what? Sure. sure. Real quick here, just, I'm just going to reiterate what kind of what Tony says. Yeah, we, we're, uh, we're open with the dictionary. Happy to sit down. Even, and we, we use AutoMap, which is kind of just kind of clunky. Mm -hmm. I, I know I know there's people, I can see people on this call right now who are way more sophisticated than us that can improve upon what we're doing. Um, you know, and uh, so we're happy to show you like AutoMap. It's kind of not, not that hard. That's why we use it. It gets the job done, but I encourage um, perhaps more sophistication there if you can. I think people can just do it better. Uh, in terms of the so what question, I think I think it I think that's kind of the challenge with all the grammar actually. I mean, one thing that that you know as we kind of do this, one thing we do like that I do like about it is it is kind of providing kind of broad contours of of large samples of public policy, and you and you do see kind of I kind of view it as kind of like in our classification of let's say 
a lot of systems. And this, I kind of like the word, like thinking of clouds, for example. We have different classification of clouds. Like these are one type of clouds, these are another type of clouds. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We're just providing broad kind of like images of public policies and they're kind of like clouds. And if you want to zoom in and look at the water molecules that kind of can, you know, construct that kind of build that cloud, I think that's kind of what the kind of original grammar is kind of good for actually. It's just really zooming in there and understanding how like specific aspects of text fit together and make sense of it. But I think what we're, what, what the, the first thing, it's the so what question academically is that I think we're learning, okay, so what, at what level of abstraction uh, should we be kind of constructing, kind of pulling out the text and making sense of it? Um, and, and, and as we do that, what are the trade-offs of those different lenses for understanding that? I think that's one thing in terms of just pure categorization of these policies. And then once we kind of do that categorization of that, I think then, you know, then you can start building perhaps more theory around it. But the theory question is really hard with the grammar because it's really, I mean, there's, there's theoretical um, assumptions built into the original grammar that, that is kind of, that kind of plays itself out in kind of odd ways. And that's something I think we're still trying to figure out exactly um, <laughs> what the impacts are and, uh, behaviorally and, 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 or even on the front end, the politics that drive it. Tanya, is that? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good response. I think we have, we have other hands up. So let's just thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, and comments in the chat too, I see. So yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So I'm uh, gonna, I see the hands, but there's Jagadish posted a lengthy question in chat. Um, did you want to just go ahead and ask that rather than me reading your question? Um, yeah, well, it says, do policymakers follow- well, actually, I was actually asking oh. Jagadish if oh, you Jagadish, wanted to okay. just <laughs> talk to you directly instead of yeah, me reading yeah, from chat. Yeah, it's like, so, so I'm wondering about the, whether we as scholars do our work that we have from the policy or do they consider IG while drafting the policies? And then we are analyzing the policies. Do we give feedback to them? And do they consider? Or policymakers are doing in their own silo and we are doing our research in their own silo. We are just, just, just feedbacking each other. So what is your reflection on this general trend of the IG? Thank you. Yeah. You know, given um, okay, Tanya, if I, given that I would say most even policy scholars don't know that much about the grammar, we don't even teach it, and I would say most political scientists don't even know it exists really that much. I would say, like, definitely, I don't think any policymakers <laughs> know this. Follow the IG, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's actually okay because I think it's still kind of in the development stage. But 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 I, I would like to kind of touch my hat to Tal Saba for for creating a, a you know book on policy design uh, that's that's coming out that kind of allows us to start teaching aspects of the institutional grammar to our, uh, let's say our master students who might go into those leadership positions. I think that's one of the first stages in terms of like, if we want to like have impacts about how policies are like the design, first of all, we need to start teaching aspects of the grammar. And I think that's starting to happen, but we're still not quite there yet. I mean, Next. certainly, yeah. I, one thing I would say though, is there, there's probably some, you know, intuitive, pieces of when you think about the grammar, it's focusing on, you know, who's the target of, of the policy, <laughs> what actions are required, what are the sanctions? I mean, some of those basic functions of, of institutions are policymakers know that. They're not using the grammar per se to create to write the policies, but those ideas are certainly in in, in their minds as they're thinking about, you know, designing public policy. And so I think translating between you know, how we academically diagnose these, these types of written institutions and then what, you know, what that can, how that can inform kind of our approach to policy design is, is an important, important question, so. Yeah, real quick, I can, we can tackle those two more in the chat, that's pretty easy before we get, I see Jim and Hannah's hands up. Um, yeah, we are getting word counts, uh, Ellen, and, uh, and you can actually bring in phrasing if you want. There's there's no restrictions on that. It's just how you want to structure your dictionary, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, and um, yeah, you know, the first time we did this, we did do institutional statements, and it was a bit of a nightmare, actually. And that's why we moved to public policies, and we did that in our one paper that came out in 2018. Yeah. And 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 uh, and we actually kind of moved away from that just because it it just lacked validity in some ways, um, and and uh, and it was also unwieldy to use as a data set. Um, and of course, we just raised questions because we were doing network analysis and all this stuff with it. 
And then I'm like, okay, so why do I care if, if an actor shows up in the third versus the eighth sentence of a policy? And, and what's the theoretical justification for that? And, uh, and, I, and it just got more into more into like, maybe just care like, you when know, you get 55 policies, it just makes more sense to look at the policies and not the statements. Um, Tanya, is that? Yeah. All right. Jim. Okay, so, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Jim is next, right? Jim? He's working on his mute. Uh, there he is. 2021 all over again. <laughs> good to see you, Chris. Uh, hey, yeah, good to see you, Jim. Uh, looking at, at your method, and I've looked at university policy documents, and I've been studying legislative uh, text lately, and the concept of a translational grammar keeps coming to my mind. Chomsky talks about this. Uh, and it kind of goes back to the paper, we don't speak in institutional grammar, but if the institutional grammar is the base from which you can launch design and also do very deep analysis, uh, then you've got to have this translator in between the text that you're looking at and, and what you're going to, and the components you need to be able to analyze, which I think what you presented is going a long ways to that. Uh, if you look at legislative text, uh, you can almost tell who wrote that particular bill by certain phrases because they have phraseologies and patterns that they use. Uh, but the terms, the actors and the functions are in there are very peculiar to that particular function of government, whether it be a judiciary function, if they're you know enforcing a law or, or an agency and you know, building and enforcing regs. And it's a matter of being able to translate out of that legislative language into the operator language uh, to, to really make sense of it, unless you actually are bilingual and you speak both ways, which good agency people are. But uh, I was just thinking, one of the, the lessons I took from looking at cybersecurity policy written by various universities was that we let almost anyone write those policies. So it could be an IT guy that, you know, he kind of has English grammar under control, but nothing else. And the actor gets buried somewhere in a subjunctive clause way down this five paragraph sentence. And, and translating that becomes very difficult. But if you get down to the basics of, of the institutional grammar, it's kind of like your email statements where you had the professor must receive the email from the student during the exam. Well, I think the correct institutional grammar form is the student must email the professor during the exam. So the attribute is the actor responsible for the action, which is what Ostrom and Crawford were talking about. And I applaud you going back to that definition. It's very basic. Uh, but you, you literally have to ex extract the attribute from the object of a conditional or, or a prepositional phrase. And that takes a translator. Uh, I, I think that's the right direction. I don't really have a question here. I just I see this going in a direction that can be very helpful, even to the point that these translators could produce and reduce these policies into English statements that people will understand, thus making policy more understandable by those that need to do it. So there's my long editorial comment. I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Tanya? I was just gonna say, good comment. I mean, it reminds me why I encourage my, my master's students to not write in the passive voice and use the active voice. <laughs> um, it's just easier to interpret. So, um, yeah, and if we're trying to analyze policies and things are, are written in long passive um, clauses that have the actors at the very end of the statement, it is, it is difficult to interpret, especially when you're looking at the institutional statement level. And that was one of the reasons why we tried to step back and, as Chris said, kind of look at the, the clouds of the shape of these policies uh, rather than. Um, more of the micro details. I just add one thing there. Mm -hmm. it, it is like Tony and I have been working on oil and gas for like a long time, D over a decade now, I think, maybe not a long time. Um, and, and and so we know the topical area. And so when we create like actor categories, the these object kind of categories, we can do that because we kind of. I mean, it's not translation, maybe like you're saying, but but it, but it does mean that we know the context actually. And if you don't know the context of the policy, especially complicated policies, I think any, any institutional grammar approach will kind of, kind of flop a little bit. Um, and, and, and also I would say, this goes back to one of the first things about, you know, what we're doing. I think, what we're, I don't know if what we're doing is going to be, you know, super viable in terms of policymakers, maybe, uh, but right now I think we're just trying to figure out a better topology 
uh, for our own understanding and own knowledge. And, and, and we are kind of, given that meaning can be so um, distorted in the grammar, um, and when we look at it, we've kind of said, hey, let's just recognize that. And it's, we're kind of like, in a way, circumventing the issue of meaning, which I think does require that translator, that in-depth analysis. And I don't think you can do that with, I mean, you could, you could do that with 55 public policies, but I really don't want to spend too much of my time <laughs> doing that. It'd just be too hard. Um, Anna? Thank you. Um, I'm a researcher from University of Warsaw, quite new to this field. So I'm very impressed with what has been said and uh, the article. And uh, I'm sorry if my question is maybe uh, too simple. Uh, but as I said, it's just the beginning of my adventure. <laughs> so uh, as a lawyer and political scientist, I was very struck how much uh, uh, benefits uh, legal field uh, might find in uh, the institutional grammar and I was thinking how much your own research uh, uh, goes back or finds any bridges with uh, the legal analysis and the current uh, debate that are held in lawyers uh, uh, milieu regarding uh, the way to improve uh, the normative regulations, the text of norms and uh, how to improve um, the processes that are called juridization of social life. Uh, so I was just wondering how much you you inspire yourself or you find any relevant references to to legal analysis and to and to lawyers. Um, um, so that's my question. Thank you. That's a that's a great question, Hannah, and and not a simple question <laughs> at all. Um, I would say we haven't delved in enough into some of the the insights from legal analysis I think um, you know we we've really been focused more on kind of refining our our, our methods of the semi-automated approach for this kind of institutional grammar application um, and that could be a, a definitely a, a valuable area to look in as we start thinking about more of the Kind of in interpretation and analysis of this type of data. Uh, we've finally gotten to the point where we can extract the data, analyze it with some kind of simplistic approaches, but you know the, the literature that we have to go on um, isn't, isn't much. So digging into the legal field could be certainly could be insightful. And if you have ideas, please email them. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, I'll just I'll just add on to that. You know, I think our goal, I mean, of course, our goal is to contribute knowledge somehow, right? But of the knowledge we're contributing, I think it's kind of been, I mean, Tony, you can please disagree. It's almost been methodological to some extent. Mm -hmm. so, like it's just, we're there to do this and we're doing it to solve a problem. The problem we're trying to solve is basically what are the broad contours of public policy? Because we've been in, it's like, what are the, like, it's like looking at the forest what's the, or the cloud. What are the broad contours of patterns of it? We're not interested in where the branches are in a, a particular tree. We just want to know the broad contours of it. And so we needed a methodological approach to it. And so we just went back to Crawford and Nostrum to figure that out. Um, I think like the questions about influencing policymakers, which is great, bringing in legal analysis, which is great. Um, even though what Jim was talking about, all great ideas, but, and those are things that definitely either tips and knowledges, insights we could bring into the technique or theoretical aspects of it or applications we just haven't imagined. But we're just not, I don't think we're quite there yet, Tanya. Are we? We're just yeah. still, we're still yeah, trying we're to figure still this out. Struggling through the method. Um, and, and we are, but of course we do this and we do some proof of concepts with theories. We're like, hey, this is interesting. We can inform polycentricity. Um, but uh, it's, we still have a long ways to go and help and welcome others to help out, I, I, I guess. So Elizabeth uh, posted an interesting insight in the chat. Elizabeth, I don't know if you wanted to, I don't want to lip sync you. <laughs> oh yeah, just not a, not a question. I just think this discussion is really, really interesting about kind of the unit of analysis and why. And I think Chris, you just kind of summed up a lot of my thinking that it's been really focused on advancing the methods of how to do this and taking a step back and figuring out, you know, why it, what do these different components really correspond to theoretically? And if this is just about aggregating, then maybe we 
change the unit of analysis, um, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. yeah, don't have anything to add other than I've been thinking a lot about this to compare. We're only trying to compare institutional rules about one type of one type of rule, just information rules across 16 cases, and it's becoming really, really challenging even when we narrow it down to something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the unit of analysis is important, and, and but it's also driven by your, your question and what you're interested in. So our unit of analysis, but what we're doing in this application or these approaches isn't going to be appropriate for, for all questions. So you know, really understanding what, what your question is about is, is critical. Uh, Christopher? Thank you. Uh, uh, just uh, one short question. You talked about the cloud, uh, Tanya and Chris. Uh, the clouds, as you know, constellations, I guess, of, of aggregate institution statements. Um, did you, did you, are there some labels you were able to put on those clouds and perhaps also to consider those in comparative studies? Like if you had, let's say, other domains and other groups of policies, you know, how would those clouds relate and what, what is the meaning and the relationship in between, um, just to give a sense, because that sounds really interesting. Right. Um, I think that's what, what we're trying to get to. I and mean, we, we, we have 15 states we can compare, but it's only oil and gas. So we can actually compare that. We also can compare like the, the way that different, that you sort of, sort of saw with that little heat diagram. You can compare actually the, even the, the, the type of clouds that different eight, different venues create and how those clouds kind of overlap actually be like the, the type of policies they're, creating, they're, they're adopting. Like this agency deals with negative externality. That's the kind of whatever that cloud is, whatever we're trying to describe it as. This one deals a lot with information or these type of actors. Um, and, and you know, and so I think I think we're getting there, but I think we need, um, it, it, that's where the comparison comes in, right? Um, Tanya, is that? Yeah, I mean, you know, our, our best points of comparison right now could be taking the, the Colorado data and then our California data because we have we have bills like legislation, regulations, executive orders um, from all, all from both of those states, and we we could do a more direct comparison, which we had in intended to do, but we wound up kind of looking at the data in a slightly different way in our most recent Colorado paper. And we're kind of learning as we go of the methods and the analysis. And now we need to sit down and take the same kind of lens or, or approach and, and compare across uh, different states. Um, but we, we can also look over time to, to see how these clouds change over time as well within a state. So we do have data that goes from, you know, like 12 years of, of policy making. And so we can look at the shape of a cloud in time one and then time 10 and see how that cloud has changed. Um, and that can offer some useful insights as well. Yeah. By the way, there's also a question, I don't know, if, uh, in, um, and this is something related to Chris, but on the action, the action situations. And you know, in one of our studies, in fact, what we presented last year, and we do have a backup slide on this, if people wanna see it, you can cluster, like let's say the, what we're finding in the policies and this, we did California and you can find basically like different, you know, these policies cluster into different essentially action situations and they kind of make sense and they involve certain like functions and, and actors and that sort of thing. And um, this is what it looks like actually. And this is just in California. And, and this is the same thing we showed before. These are all the actions on the outside, the laws are on the inside and these laws basically target what we think different action situations. And we kind of have those five labeled at the bottom. And, um, and, and you know, and what's neat about this is it's just another way of kind of doing the comparison. We don't have the explanatory model. Here. Like we're not like trying to, like, like we don't really have much beyond this, but we do know that this is like perhaps a basis that we can lead to, I don't know, better comparisons and understanding the, what these clouds look like. Um, and these clouds are kind of embedded or nested too in a way. Like it's interesting in California, there's really, there's five clouds. Maybe in other places there'd be 10 for the same system. Anyone else? Saba, see your hand up. Oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Tanya and Chris, for your presentation. Um, more, more of just, I guess, a comment. Um, 
at the conclusion of the seminar, I what I really like about what you're doing is you're showcasing that you know the grammar doesn't have to be used one way particularly. Um, so you've basically taken the features, if you will, uh, that are of interest given your research question, mm -hmm. and you're relying on those. And I think that that's a that's and and even like operated at a scale that's useful for your research question. I think that's really um, a, a nice illustration to show that. You don't have to use, um, yeah. You don't have to basically analyze your data on each state on each component. Uh, on even you know at the statement, you can sort of use this flexibly, um, but still have a very systematic something systematic upon which to, you know, assess institutional design. So I really love that about your application. So thank you for highlighting that. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks for bringing Thanks, that up too. <laughs> I, I do think that's the. One of the things we've been learning in in the IGRI over the last couple of years, you know, and having this research network, that there are some really cool ways that we can adapt and and apply this and and be creative. And this mm -hmm. is that's the cool part of the academic endeavor. Mm -hmm. So it's been it's been fun learning and growing. There's always more to learn, though. <laughs> <laughs>